everyone, my name is Sarah LaVon and welcome back to my YouTube channel. We are back for the first 2022 Coffee and Questions. This is a series where I get to answer your questions from previous videos and then from an Instagram poll. So if you don't follow me on Instagram, make sure you head on over there and follow me at Bundle Birth and then check out my stories at some point towards the end of the month where I give you an opportunity to ask one of your questions and maybe get it answered on one of these videos. So I'm gonna be answering your questions today. We will see where this conversation goes all about pregnancy, labor, birth, and postpartum. But before I do that, make sure you subscribe down below, give it a like, share it with a friend as usual, and then let's get answering your questions. We are gonna start with, with Instagram, and then I'm gonna go to my previous coffee and questions video from last month and see what questions came up there. We are winging it today. A lot of times I prep for this, but today I most definitely didn't. So we're gonna just, sort of play a game with myself as I answer your questions. The fact that these are even questions that I have to answer is like sad to me and also very hopeful to me based on what we're doing with bundle birth nurses. So I will just make a quick plug, plug here. If you know a labor and delivery nurse or you are a labor and delivery nurse or you want the insider scoop on labor and delivery nurse life, I do have an entire newish branch of my business where we train and support labor and delivery nurses. So if you have nursey questions, you can also an ask them here and I may answer them as well because I am a labor and delivery nurse by background. But Christina Bree says, how to deal with abrasive or intimidating nurses or doctors when you're an anxious or shy person? This could be a whole YouTube video. Most of these could be entire YouTube videos. But I think this is a really valid and also really important question. So the first video I'm gonna send you to is my rights of a patient video, which I can link down below or we can put on a little card up here, um, because I think you have to understand first and foremost what your rights are. What can you say? What can't you say? And I think a lot of times in the hospital setting, you sort of are like, whatever you say, doctor, whatever you say, nurse. And of course you want your baby safe, you want you to be safe, and you are looking to their expertise to keep you safe and help you make wise choices along the way. Mind you, labor and birth, so what I'm gonna give as like one tip to get you started, and then if you want the whole video, I could talk about this all day, but my one tip to get you started, other than watching that video, is understanding that labor and birth as a medical specialty is different than everywhere else in the hospital setting. So if I have cancer or I have appendicitis, there is a very clear course of medical action to take to help cure me of my cancer or of my appendicitis, probably an appendectomy. If I have surgery, that, that surgery has a very clear step-by-step -step process. Labor and birth is not like that. First of all, it's not pathological. You are not sick when you come to the hospital. Most, and mind you, can you be sick and are there complications? Yes, and those that's why you have a provider following you in, in your course of care, but you're not sick in labor and labor is a totally normal, natural process that happens whether we like it or not and there's nothing wrong with it, right? So understanding that, it also provides for this opportunity of so much variation of what the outcome could be, what your choices could be, et cetera. So I'll give you an example. Your doctor comes in and they say, we need to break your water. And you go, well, why? Which you should be asking why, which is why you watch my patient rights video. And you say, why? What are the risks? What are the benefits? What are my other options? And they give you this slew of information and you go, hmm, based on that information, I don't know that I feel comfortable with breaking my water right now. What if I, we wait another like two, three hours? This is based on your whole conversation. That's all, again, a whole other video, right? And they go, okay, and, and that's it. <laughs> Whereas if you have appendicitis and you are, you are very sick and you need an appendectomy, it's like there's really no variation to that unless you want and you really truly are risking the outcome of waiting and letting your appendix burst and potentially ending up septic and all of that, the complications that come with that. You can die of appendicitis. Most of the time you won't though if you seek medical care and you follow the course of action. Make sense? So with the idea of labor, labor is different, that there is so much variation. And so this is why I would say having a robust support team that can know how to advocate for you, that can you can take my childbirth classes with, you can watch that patient rights video, to be able to know how to facilitate these conversations by knowing your rights and understanding that 
if you give the right pushback, right, that you're saying, I don't understand. You have the right to information. You have the right to understand what's going on and feel comfortable with whatever decision is made. That decision being yours, not theirs. This is this is the way the medical world in theory should be. Isn't doesn't always end up. Okay, and so knowing your rights, having support around you, and this is where like a lot of times when I'm at the bedside, I see this all the time, where there will be something that comes up, I can tell the patient doesn't feel comfortable with it. They look at me and I go, do you want a second to think about it? We talk about it, they come up and they, they voice their concerns, they come to a resolve, and then they also have me being like, that seems reasonable from a medical perspective, and they go, oh, okay. That gives them that little boost of confidence. They give a little bit of pushback, and the doctor's like, great, no problem. And all of a sudden, it like becomes a non-issue, <laughs> right? Whereas you have to sort of see that labor and birth provides for lots of flow and fluidity in what, what your decisions are. Now, are there moments where it is a moment where your doctor is saying, it is unsafe for us to proceed this way? Yeah. But that's where having a trusting relationship with your provider ahead of time that you can trust that when they use that card, it's really for real. Versus being like, I don't know if I trust them. And then now you're trying to play doctor when you're not a doctor either. And having that responsibility is a lot. That's much more long-winded than I was anticipating or trying to get to, but I hope that sort of gets you started. Really what I would wanna to say to you, Christina, is that you have the right to understand what's going on. And so a simple, help me understand what you mean by fill in the blank and using that or I don't get it. Can you explain that to me? Those little phrases to get more information, sort of stall it and sort of slow people down, that that, that will hopefully help you along the way. Okay, hmm. this sort of goes along those same lines. All right, Danielle says, my doc is recommending against a VBAC, a vaginal birth after a cesarean, or otherwise known as a TOLAC. We're gonna go with VBAC. She says she's not even pregnant yet. Are they really that bad? I've always dreamt of having an all natural birth, so I was really hoping for a VBAC. And by natural, we're gonna say vaginal birth. So. This is where I do have two videos. You can you can search on my channel about VBAC. So put in VBAC and they should come up to talk about the risks of a VBAC. VBACs are, are sort of a subjective thing. There is a slew of providers, some that will say, I don't even take them. No, I'm totally against it. That's their personal opinion. And there are others that are very pro VBAC, very supportive, very like, yeah, let's do it. No problem. I trust in the process, right? So your biggest risk is uterine rupture. I'm gonna send you to my VBAC class because especially if you're not pregnant yet, and this is something you're interested in, you are going to want to strategize. One of your strategies is finding a provider that is supportive. And if your doctor is already recommending against a VBAC, unless they can give you some very unique, specific reason for your body versus just VBAC in general, then there are providers that would say that VBAC is considered a safe option. So if that's what you want, I think you should take my VBAC class and the, the spark notes of my VBAC class is that you maybe need to look into finding another provider, which I hate saying in a public platform, but it's the right thing in this case. If, if you're not aligned with your preferences and what your doctor is willing to, to do with you, then there are other providers out there likely. Alex Micken says, tips for staying relaxed during the triage or admission process in the hospital. Because when you go to the hospital, most of the time you're gonna go to a triage room, which is a smaller room where they check you in, they decide whether you stay or you go, and then once they know you're in labor, they move you to a labor room or a delivery room, okay? So in that kind of in-betweener state, I love this question. I think it's so not even thought about, including for me. So I just taught for A1, which is the Association of Women's and Neonatal Nurses. It's like our governing body for all perinatal nurses. And I taught about physiologic coping. And I do have a video coming on that where I'm gonna give you a snippet into this that I think is such an important message. So make sure you subscribe down below so you don't miss that. Um, but one of the things that I found in my research for that class was that there was a there was a, a really interesting, it was sort of a study slash a like toolkit that a hospital in London made when they looked at the birth environment and the, the outcome of having a more supportive birth environment. What does that mean? A lot of things. That could be the lighting, that could be the color choice. Like how do you design the perfect birth unit? And one of the things that was my biggest takeaway from reading this study, and I can link the study down below, it's on the old side, but I thought it was super interesting, was thinking about the entire patient 
process in getting them to the birth. If we're trying to support the body to do what it knows how to do, and we know that fear gets in the way, this is a preview for my ne- one of my next videos, is ha- what happens when they're parking? What happens when they're walking up? How does that process make them feel? What happens in the triage rooms and in the triage process? And so I love that you brought this up because I have personally been thinking and pondering on this. And so my tips for you real quick, and again, this could be a whole video, let me know if you want it per usual, is um, is to sort of work on getting in the zone prior to getting to the hospital, right? You labor at home or maybe you have an induction and so you're sort of like in this mindset. And so when you come into that, and you wouldn't normally go to triage in an induction, so it sort of goes for all circumstances, but you kind of like get in this zone where like I am in my body, I am focused on on my sensations, on my partner, and sort of like creating this, I mean, you steal from hypnobirthing, this bubble of peace around you that when you walk in that your support team knows that we're keeping the lights dim that we're keeping our voices like this versus hey guys welcome to the hospital like that's gonna whoa wake up your nervous system right so sort of creating this calm around you if you put in headphones you can especially if you're trying to go without an epidural um and then when you get into triage that your support team would sort of set the tone for the room they set the temperature connect with that triage nurse and just say we're trying trying to keep this real physiologic and real calm. If we could sort of slow things down, that would be really helpful for her labor. Um, And so then you sort of don't have to take care of your surroundings. And so that surroundings, I gave you those examples, that could look different for different people. Um, That could be, I like all the lights on or something. Um, Fine, flex and flow, but you sort of thinking about what your preferences are, making sure your team knows what your preferences are and they're setting the tone of the room so you can be fully kind of just present in your body and focused on laboring and contracting. That's my quick answer to that, quickish. So Talisha says, what can you do late in third trimester realizing your midwife or OB are not on your team or for you? Ooh, this is hard. Okay, so this is why prevention, for those of you listening, I'm going to talk to you specifically, Talisha, but for those of you that are early in your pregnancy or are not pregnant yet, I cannot say more that your provider matters significantly and the birth environment that you choose to give birth in, and you most of the time do have a choice, you may be limited in your choice based on your insurance, et cetera but there almost always are options. Now, late in third trimester, if you are feeling like you are not vibing or you are concerned about something, first of all, I would voice your concerns to your provider. And this is challenging, I will say. And there is a power dynamic that I that exists in medicine that I cannot ignore, that is very much the case. I wish it wasn't the case, but it is, right? There's sort of this like you look, the doctor looks down on you, right? Or like not intentionally, but there's sort of like they are the boss. And so I would bring up your concerns if you can. Okay, and I know that's challenging, but I would say, hey, I feel like there's a mismatch here. How do we reconcile this so that I can have this birth process or these preferences respected, given that you are kind of like a paying customer, right? And you may not pay them directly, but like they're providing a service for you, right? All within the realm, and this is what I want you to understand from a medical perspective, is that your medical team wants to keep you safe. That is their ultimate goal. And whether they're functioning out of the same lens as you of what safety looks like, they're functioning out of the lens. They're not there to harm you, okay? And while you may have heard stories of that, that I I can say very confidently, knowing the medical community that your doctors, your midwives, your nurses are there to help you. They want to do their best for you. But their opinion about things, that goes back to that like labor is weird and it's like not like an appendectomy, right? It's not like a clear course. There's lots of options. But their opinions, their experience, their expertise may guide in a certain way. They may have a certain way of doing it and that may be different than yours. So it's can we reconcile, right? I understand, help me understand where you're coming from. And this is where like out of respect to their profession, to their expertise, to the years that they have under their belt, There's something there probably to pay attention to, right? We don't wanna just say like, I know everything and say like, well, what does your medical degree do for you? 
at the same time saying, can I understand where you're coming from, but can you understand where I'm coming from? How do we get to a to an agreement, okay? That's my, like, the ideal scenario. Now, you may come to a point where you just don't vibe. You are saying, this is not good for me, this is not good for my mental health, and I will encourage you that you have to do what's best for you. No one will put you first in that scenario other than yourself, and if you have an internal sense I have been in this scenario personally where the energy was off. It was, I had little icky intuition about, about a certain scenario. And so what I did, and it was hard for me, I changed doctors in this scenario. And so the same thing is, can go for you. Now, late in trimester, you may need to call around and you may need to say, look, I'm not vibing with my, with my provider. You will need to request all of your medical records. That may make it easier for you because they wanna see that you've had prenatal care. They wanna see like the record of what's happened and have you been healthy and what are they taking on? Because the concern medically is that like, I haven't followed you. I don't know you. I don't, I, I can't give you individualized care if, if I haven't been following you this whole time, right? And it's too late in the pregnancy. What if there's something that's missed? So if you can provide those documents, that may make it easier for you. And then I would call around and just see what your options are, contact your insurance and see what other providers may work, interview them and see if someone will take you. I've seen late transfers of care. Um, most of the time it's with healthy pregnancies and most of the time it's with people who have their records. So again, I wish you all, like I, I really want to send, I think like the, the, confidence and encouragement to have these conversations with your providers first before firing them. <laughs> because there may just be a miscommunication. There may be a, they were having an off day and ooh, I feel bad. But now that we talked about it, we can actually resolve the conflict versus running away from it. Um, and if you can resolve it, ultimately it is going to be better for you, for you to have the same doctor throughout all of your care. Now, are there moments where you're misaligned? Yes. And so I also encourage you that if you are truly misaligned and you've done that work, that you would look into finding another provider. Michelle Shell says, what colors are normal from a mucus plug? Anything totally clear to like a light yellow, tan, globby snot <laughs> colors. Um, but if we're getting brown, green, dark red, like it's bloody, like super duper bloody, it be, can be kind of bloody, that's technically a bloody show. All of that, not so cool, but anything from totally clear to like a tannish yellow, totally normal. Mm. Kayla Alexis says, why are stillbirths never talked about? My son was stillborn on 4-5-21. Um, I am so sorry for your loss, Kayla. Um, challenging, to say the least. And that's why people don't talk about them, to be honest. That's why, I mean, even miscarriage, it took me like three and a half years to talk about miscarriage because it's just like, it's hard to know what to say. It's hard to know how to be helpful. Um, and while I think it's important to talk about, hence why I'm going there now, I think that from a like educator's perspective, it's like, how do I make it better? I can't necessarily, other than maybe providing you with some resources on that. So I think it's important to talk about, and I think that it's important to destigmatize, but I think they're not talked about because it's uncomfortable to talk about. Nicole Bundy says, when should an IUD be removed in order to get pregnant quick? So in general, if you're trying to get pregnant, what I have heard, and Dr. Gadir would say otherwise, but the research that I had read was that if you wanna get pregnant with an IUD, technically you can get pregnant the next month after they pull the IUD. So if you are trying to maybe not get pregnant, but you're trying to also let your hormones reset, which I'll say in a second, um, you need to like use protection if you've pulled it because you can technically get pregnant right after an IUD removal. My, my sister is the perfect case for that. She hadn't even had a period and she was pregnant with baby number two coming in June of 2022. So stay tuned because we will most definitely be doing videos for that. So, um, so in order to get pregnant quick, now it can take up to a year for after, if you've been on hormonal birth control, this goes for IUD, this goes for the pill, for sort of your body to reset and sort of like let your hormones take over, everybody's different. Now, if you are on the older side, say over 35, I wouldn't wait a year, I would wait less than that, probably six month-ish. 
But if you're under 35 and you're saying, I have some time, I know I don't want six kids, then I would wait a year. That's my own personal what I have done, but I would reach out to your fertility specialist or your OBGYN to specifically have those conversations based on you and your body and your history, okay? The other question that came here that I think is really interesting. My husband doesn't want a doula. He is great under pressure. How can I explain the need? How can doulas help for medicated births? Now, medicated, I think, can mean a lot of things. I'm gonna assume that means without an epidural. That could also mean in some circles that are not induced, that are unmedicated would be not induced. Medicated would be like, say, an induction where you're having Pitocin to help with contractions, et cetera. You can see my videos on that. Um, so I, I have a lot I could say about this. One is your husband is not a birth professional. They have not done the amount of training. You think about how many videos I have on birth related things and I still have a queue of like hundreds more of things that we could talk about. It is not realistic to expect for him to learn about all things birth to be fully prepared for every scenario of birth. Now is every doula always prepared for that? No, but they've at least been to a few slash thousands of births to be able to give you a frame of reference of normal versus not normal, okay? The other thing is that your, your doula does not replace your husband, okay? Your doula is actually supportive of the husband in high pressure scenarios so they can be supportive of you because you have a different bond than the doula will ever have, right? But it's that added unbiased resource that is only there for you. They don't work for the hospital. They don't work for the doctor. There's no like other dynamics happening outside the room. They are solely focused on knowing you, knowing your preferences, and then also being that like kind of voice of reason, that support and encouragement, that those resources I'll talk about unmedicated in a second, to help you navigate through the weird stuff that can come up along the way that may feel overwhelming and probably is overwhelming for the average person. The other thing is they don't have the like layer of this is my child, right? And the emotion of, I'm gonna make whatever decision out of fear because this is my child, right? They're a little bit removed enough that they can objectively look at the scenario and see what's happening in the room to help you know how to advocate for yourself. The other thing is they have resources and tools that your, your husband may know and hopefully you've done your coping with labor classes and all of that. But it's, it's one thing to do a class versus to like live and breathe this stuff and have read every book on the shelf about all of this stuff to be able to pull in weird scenarios as labor will flex and flow. Labor is not cookie cutter, right? It looks a lot of different ways. So you're pulling from this resource in the room to help you cope, to help you know how to keep labor progressing, to help you know what's normal, what's not normal, how to navigate the different dynamics in the room with the different people in the room. So it's, it's a whole nother layer, whereas then what it does for your husband is it frees them up to be fully present with you and connect and love and touch and support in a way that only they can do versus them also now having the responsibility of all the other things and all the other dynamics going on in the room. They can just be fully present with you. So I think that piece is beautiful. Now, how can a doula help with a medicated birth? First of all, they're consistent from start to finish. You come in and you have your husband that's consistent from start to finish, but also they're tired, they're awake the whole time. If you nap, they can nap, and then you still have somebody sort of watching what's going on. And so there's that like one consistent voice that sees the whole picture from beginning to end versus your nurses that switch out every 12 hours, your doctor pops in every so often. So there's that piece. And then there's the, the idea of position changes, making sure you're comfortable, the knowledge and information deficit that will exist because labor is weird, flex and flow, that they can fill in the gaps for or helping you advocate giving, given different scenarios. I will say most of my patients are medicated, meaning they have an epidural, most meaning probably like 60%. Um, which is like the national average. And still to this day, I hear all the time, like I would never do it without you because of that added confidence boost. Like I talked about in the beginning of today of, oh, I can ask that question. Or I'll be like, yeah, like they'll be asking a question. They'll start like kind of giving some pushback and I'll be like, mm-hmm, you got it, you got it, yes. And they'll be like, oh yeah. And then, so then I was like really wondering if you could answer this question. All of a sudden it's like they have like the, the like support to feel like this is valid and, and to be told that their concerns are valid when sometimes in the room it may not feel like that. Well, and this reminds me, I'm actually gonna tag this on to the last question um, because Brian is in the room. He is my 
I'm gonna say my film master because he does like all the things for me and saves my life. And he was talking about his birth. And I think one of the things that is, I, this is probably also a whole YouTube video, but like the evidence shows that having a doula decreases the risk for your baby and increases your chances of a vaginal birth, of your baby not going to the NICU, of needing an epidural, of better outcomes. It's like the most cost effective way to have a better outcome than like most other things. The evidence is like wildly clear. Now mind you why it's not covered by insurance and like it's definitely a money issue most of the time. And so that's where I will say that to me, there's nothing worth your mental health. And I have said that the whole time, but birth is a unique opportunity for trauma. And unfortunately, up to 30% is the number we talk about, although I would say in the last two years that that's probably higher um, based on the current situation in the world, that um, up to 30% of women would be traumatized or consider themselves traumatized from their labor and birth. Now, mind you, that's up to 80% would use that word to describe their birth. Like, whoa, hold on, right? We want you bonded. We want you whole and healthy and it to be the happiest day of your life. And a doula is one of the best ways to accomplish a less traumatic or untraumatic birth. Everything is harder done alone. And part of the, part of the like risk of trauma is that isolation and that unknowing and trauma also, by the way, not only for the birthing person, but also for the partner, <laughs> that there's there's new data coming out on partners being traumatized through the experience. And so it's like you add that extra layer of protection there that helps you be bonded and really does have lasting mental impact for generations to come. To me, having the right support and not just any support, but having the right support and pursuing and doing every layer of protection against having a traumatic birth is the best investment of your money that you could have um, in, in going into your labor and birth. It's my PSA for doulas. Find yourself a doula. Um, and there are doula, there's doula programs out there, there's scholarships, there are agencies, there are ways to make it work. And also check with your insurance because even for me, I can provide a super bill to my clients and part of my fees a lot of times are covered for through insurance as well. So wrapping that one up, all right? That's a whole other video. I gotta do some one on, on doulas. I could talk about your questions. Your questions on Instagram are just so exciting to me. But let me find my most recent Coffee and Questions video. You can check that out. The last one I did was live. I do occasionally do live videos on YouTube. Um, and those are always really fun to be able to connect with you live. And I will most of the time end up answering your questions live if you can attend. So stay tuned on Instagram. That's usually where I post about it. Let me find some of your questions from last month's Coffee and Questions. Hannah Rooks says, coffee and questions, does nipple stimulation still help induce or progress labor even if you normally do not receive pleasure from nipple stimulation? Is pleasure required? You've most definitely seen my video on how to induce labor naturally. Um, no, pleasure is not necessarily required. It is a biological response that when the nipple is stimulated, it releases oxytocin. So this is why also like a breast pump can be helpful. So when you're breast pumping, pumping your breasts, <laughs> they like, you're not like, oh yes, my breasts and my pump. Like it doesn't, it's not exciting to you, okay? And it still can work. So if you don't receive pleasure from it, fine. I say in that video that like ideally you kind of do because it sort of is like this added effect of the oxytocin release of like, hmm, my nipples. <laughs> Christina West says, my pelvic floor is no bueno. Babe is now 16 months, going to try for a second soon. Is it worth fixing my pelvic floor prior to a second birth or a waste of time? Thanks, my favorite person to watch on YouTube. That's so cute. Okay, there's another one, um, pubic symphysis pain. I have a video coming on that. And then there is, I have a two-year-old and I'm planning to get pregnant again soon. I was told I have pelvic floor dysfunction. Will that be a problem for this next pregnancy? I was referred to a physical therapist, but I don't have insurance. Okay. Your physical therapy in theory, again, everybody's insurance everywhere should be covered, especially if you can prove the need. And any time you have a baby, there is a need for a pelvic floor physical therapist. So I would give some pushback on that. I would sort of fight to get your pelvic floor therapy covered. My answer to this is absolutely, it is worth your time. 
And the reason for this is that your pelvic floor is a muscle, right? If there's any kind of dysfunction, any kind of weakness, any kind of damage, any kind of healing, pain, scarring, that pregnancy puts added strain on an already unresolved issue. And then you have chance of having a worse issue after the second baby. This is why like a pelvic organ prolapse. So actually where like people's vaginas technically kind of like fall out of them, their bladder can fall out, like the pelvic floor holds the pelvic organs in place, that it normally doesn't happen after one baby. It happens after multiple babies. And I will say multiple babies that haven't had time to heal with that tone, pelvic floor therapy is incredibly, incredibly helpful and incredibly effective if actually done and performed right. And I think, this is my personal opinion, I think pelvic or I think physical therapy maybe hasn't had the best vibe in the world, but there's a reason why it's an entire master's prepared specialty. Because if you actually apply the simple but also very effective techniques that yes, if you're having pain, if you're peeing yourself, if you've been told you have any kind of pelvic floor issues, please, please, please go see your OBGYN. And I will say OBGYN is moving in this direction, but your OB may not be as aware of how helpful pelvic floor therapy can be in other places in the world. I will say I'm in the US, but other places in the world, this is standard of care. This is, you see a pelvic floor therapist as a part of your prenatal and postnatal course. And so to me, this would be a way that the, the culture of the United States should be moving. We're a little behind on the time, so make it the times yourself and go find yourself and advocate for that pelvic floor therapy. Next question, have you ever seen a vaginal breach delivery? So this comes from, I have two breach deliveries. What that means is, is that baby is butt down instead of head down. And so um, the answer to that is yes, I have. I've seen multiple vaginal breach deliveries. They're mostly all with the same provider here in LA because there is one provider here that is like known for doing beautiful vaginal breach delivery. The most recent one was twins. And um, they are a little bit gnarly, I will say. They're not usually the most zen experience. Like with a vaginal birth, it can be a lot like <clears throat> breathe into it, now push, blah, blah, blah. Whereas because of the added risk of head entrapment, the baby's head getting stuck inside, it's, there's, there's a little layer of added stress from my experience and not necessarily with every provider, but it just, it becomes a little more medicalized than like a vertex or a head down baby, um, but it can be done. You just need a provider though that 100% is trained and feels confident in it. Because if you have a provider that doesn't, that to me is like the biggest risk. They need to know what they're doing and have like a very clear, um, clear stats on it that they like have experience and they're not just winging it because it is, it can be serious. Paula Olmo says, second labor, I am more nervous this time around because my first one was so quick and I always hear that you have to wait at home because it can take a long time, et cetera, but I do not see any video that helps people who have rapid deliveries, how to prepare, et cetera, for that type of delivery. So this is where I have a lot of videos about when to go to the hospital, true signs of labor, what is labor, and my typical response because this is the truth for the general public that first babies take a long time, sit at home, stall. When I'm laboring with people, I'm constantly stalling. Mind you, there is such a thing as precipitous birth, which is from start of contractions to birth of baby in less than three hours. And so if you had a fast birth the first time around that, and there's another comment on here I see that was like pretty traumatic for her, um, that, that, that is the potential for the second time around to be totally frank. And so yes, you need to be ready that, but also I think there's this, and I'm dealing with this currently, I'm currently on call. I have been in contact with my second, the second time mom who I labored with the first time and it took a while where there's this element of the, the vibe is that the second babies, they fly out. They happen so fast. And so second time moms I'm finding, especially because I have a lot of repeat clients right now, are like so stressed about having to deliver their own baby, okay? And this is where my piece of advice for you is twofold. One is, and this I have said it every single labor video, is your instinct and your sensation, your sense about what's going on, this baby is coming, is paramount. 
There is nothing more important. There is no piece of advice that I could tell you about how labor goes that is more important than you saying, no, these sensations have significantly increased. I feel rectal pressure. I feel like this baby is coming. Please go to the hospital, okay? No one's telling you to wait home. Please go. Because it could be coming, right? There is such a thing as fast births. The, uh, so the, your instinct is paramount. And the second, the second piece of advice I have for you is that your labor sensations still exist, okay? So I think there's like this like, oh, the baby just like falls out of you. And it, it does not. You still have to have contractions. You still have discomfort. You still feel rectal pressure, whether you have an epidural or not. And if you do have an epidural, most of the time you feel rectal pressure, sometimes you don't. But the idea is there's there, you still go through the process, whether that process takes two hours or whether that process takes 12, the process still has to be completed. And so, a lot of times I'm finding in currently with this client who you may see later because she is letting me vlog her birth. Make sure you subscribe and we'll see what comes out once she's in labor. But you, you, it's easy to be like, oh, like contraction baby. And that's not how it is. It's, are they more painful? I ask the exact same questions. These contractions are happening, but are they painful? No then you're probably not in labor yet, right? Practice, yay. Little bit of bloody show we had yesterday. She still not had her baby, okay? So it's you have to still understand the process of labor and then use your instinct to navigate. I There is so much shift in my sensations over the last hour that I gotta go. Then go and get checked out. There's nothing wrong with that either. And even if they send you home, then they send you home and now you have the information. Okay, so I think it's easy to be on guard. Don't be on guard. Trust in the process. Listen to your body. And um, I was gonna say call 911 if the baby's coming that fast. <laughs> I mean, really, like if you're catching your own baby, call 911 and dry them off, put them skin to skin, rub their back, make them cry. And most of the time, if it comes truly that fast, everything is okay. That is all I have time for today. I hope you found that really helpful. I appreciate the questions and sort of it's interesting to see the vibe and culture of like what's going on based on your questions. So keep commenting down below. This is the video that I will go back to. So if you have a question you want answered next time, ask it in the comment section down below. Make sure you subscribe, follow me on Instagram. Also know that I have an entire website of resources to you, including multiple different types of class classes, products, et cetera, to help you have a more confident labor and birth. And that really is my goal for you in spending your time here, that by filling your brains with these little tidbits of knowledge and sort of like getting in the flow of like what it, like what it means to talk about labor and birth and sort of like thinking about this stuff, you never know, you may need to pull from one of these resources in your labor and birth or with a friend. And I hope that I can be that loving, big sister to you as you go through your labor, birth, and into postpartum journeys. So with that, thanks for watching. And then until next time, don't forget to flex and flow and I will see you soon. Bye. Hey guys, and welcome back. We are doing it again. It's been a second since I had Brian in the house. What is this? This little nubbin. <laughs> I'm rambling. I feel my ankle is stuck. Teachy thing. Teachy thing. <laughs> okay, go back. Oh, as usual, I just can't keep it short. This is why I'm not a TikTok person. I'm locked in to doing YouTube videos for the rest of my freaking life. All right, guys. That's how it feels. <laughs>